I've been looking forward to this one. Yeah, I'm excited. Me too. It's so weird, you know, normally when I sit down to meet someone for the first time properly on camera, after a long period of time of waiting to do it, I feel like I have all this ground to cover immediately, like I gotta play catch up. But yeah. it's different with you, you know, I feel like I know you. Oh, wow. You know, and we know a few, you know, mutual people, so that yeah. makes it easier, but it's really because of the music. And I realize now that we all feel like we know you, you know, because you've been so transparent throughout your entire life on record that people feel like, we know you, and I wonder whether or not you are conscious of that at this point in your career, about to launch this new album, you know, that we know you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I have like one big family out there, Yeah, you know, kind of supporting me yeah. all these years. It's truly, they've been the fuel to the fire, you know, this whole time. Does it ever feel disconcerting as well at times, feeling like people kind of know your inner workings, but you're still trying to figure it out for you? I feel like uh, because I'm so transparent, you know, people kind of know that, uh, hey, he's human. I mean, I, at some point I did feel like, oh, people are gonna get to this place where they're gonna be like, okay, uh, you should have it figured out by now. But um, that's interesting. I truly feel like people understand and they know and, and a lot of people deal with the same sh I don't think any of us have, I mean, what does figuring it out even mean? Like, yeah. I mean, where's the journey in that, right? And that's that's what I had to discover with myself, yeah. you know, because uh, I'm thinking there's a, a quick fix and then uh, boom, everything's good yeah. and life is great yeah. forever and there's no more problems. Yeah. But that's not reality. And that's something I learned when I was in rehab and I realized that you know, you grow and you learn and you and you get these tools to mm. that you have. So when you are in a, a similar situation again, you know how to handle it. Yeah. Where before you didn't have the tools and yeah. you crumbled, yeah. you know? Yeah. So like this time around, I, I was dealing with things and I was able to handle them way differently than I might have, you know, four or five years ago. You know, it's great to hear because you've been giving people tools through your music and through your art as well. Yeah. And uh, we'll cover that and, and everything else and congrats on this new album. I can't wait to dive into it. Oh, uh, thank but you. But given thank that we're you. in a conversation space, right, and we're here in Los Angeles and, and this is a nice place to have a conversation, I, I always think about the idea of a conversation and what it means to the people I'm talking to and like what was a really meaningful conversation in your life or one of the most meaningful conversations that you can remember in your life that really helped to helped you at that moment when you needed it? Or who has been that for you? Who's the person who, who really pushes you and, and gets that information out of you and pushes you to speak to yourself? I don't know if there was like one person that, that pushed me. I think that was part of a little bit of the darkness is that I had no guidance, truly. Mm -hmm. Everything, you know, came from me, this drive. You know, it was all like conversations I would have with myself. Mm. I would always just not really talk to myself, but you know, I would have like visions of, you know, success and mm. living my dreams and, and, you know, having a family and having my mom around to see my grandkids and, and I mean, her grandkids and, mm. And your grandkids, maybe. And my grandkids too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, funny how you manifest that, you know, and then you and then you sort of take a look back at certain points in your life. You allow yourself the space to reflect. You know, if you really do manifest, if you really visualize it and stick to that, it kind of happens. Has it? Is it sort of how you imagine it to be? Yeah. Despite the challenges, I kind of imagined up until like I got my record deal and I dropped my first album. <laughs> After that. Like, it's all just like, whoa to me, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm just really fucking happy to be here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, uh, I'm doing what I love to do and people love it and they respond to it and it's helping people in a, in a, in a major way. That's like the illest, that's the, that's, that's the best shit ever. It's the same for us, because yeah. we know how tough it is for artists. Fans really do know how hard it is for the artistic spirit. Yeah. to navigate through a lot of challenges, personally, professionally, 
it's stacked, especially when you have success as quick as you did. And the fact that we're here being able to talk about the third of the trio yeah. as the trilogy reaches its conclusion with Man on the Moon 3. Yeah. Um, it's so funny, you know, I listened to this album, obviously, but in really unusual circumstances, because it was sent to me and I totally get it in a very protective way. It was like, here's one stream, you gotta <laughs> listen to it start to finish, you can't skip a fast forward, and at the end of that stream, gone, right? <laughs> so, so it was like, which I love by the way, because it just heightened the whole experience for yeah. me. Imagine if we listen to music like that now, imagine if there wasn't the whole streaming yeah, year and, yeah, this is how, yeah. and that and was the evolution, once. that was yeah. it. What would be the album that you would have listened to the most do you think start to finish in that environment throughout your life? Oh man, maybe Stank On You. Yeah. Yeah, it'd have to be an Outkast album, you know, uh, Speaker Box, Love Below. Yeah. It makes total sense. That's actually where an influence and the influenced makes total sense. Yeah. Because they've always come from somewhere else altogether. Yeah. And really, I think, relished in their outsiderness, their alienness. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Kind of adding value as they move forward. And that's kind of what Man on the Moon as a concept is, right? The isolation, almost like space oddity, is what I've always gotten yeah. out of it. Yeah. Isolation on planet Earth. Yeah. Through a metaphor. Is, is that kind of what it's always been for you? Like feeling this loneliness, but surrounded by all these people and all this energy? Yeah, definitely. That was really my life at that time. Uh, over the years, it's gotten better. Like I've surrounded myself with, you know, people I trust and, and I keep my, my, my good, real friends close. Yeah. But um, at that time, early on, yeah, for sure. Was it comforting at times? The anxiety of isolation, being in your own space? Yeah, that's when I did my best work. When I wrote my 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 best shit, or when I my best ideas were conceived, you know? I had a lot of time to just sit and think and whether it was, you know, designing the album packaging or thinking of sets for my tour, I was always like plotting something. I was always like figuring it out. Cause I always took it like, oh, I'm some art student that just got some crazy grant to make whatever he wants to make. You know? That's what a record deal was. Yeah, that's how I felt every time. Even to this day, I still feel like that, you know? Like I'm just like some art student getting like a crazy grant every year or two to just make whatever I fucking want to make, you know? Yeah, it makes sense that you came out with the concept straight away after the mixtape. One, two, and we get addicted to this idea of there's a three, and then as you said on social the other day, 10 years in the making, yeah. How did you know it was time? It was like conversations I would have with like my friends like Dodd and, and Dennis and, and then me being in the right place uh, creatively. I was already in a really good place working on Intergalactic, going crazy on the Scott shit, had that in the chamber, but then I was making something else that didn't fit those two projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think after like two or three songs, I was like, whoa, like this shit really feels like a man on the moon. Like your subconscious was guiding you in yeah, that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this is, this is what the universe is telling me to make here. So I think after like two or three songs, I was like, this is it. Like I, I made tequila shots another day and she knows this, I believe. Wow, that's literally outside of the opening. That's in chronological order. Yeah, yeah. So I made those songs first. And that's why, like, you know, you hear tequila shots and it's like, it sounds like such an introduction. It sounds like you pick right back up where we left off 10 yeah. years ago. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but with all this learning. And yeah. that's what's crazy. It's like, if you think about the star, you think about Beautiful Trip, even just the name, Beautiful Trip. It's like you've kind of made peace with all of the challenges and all of the pain you've had to go through to get yeah. to this point and it sets us off on this journey but it feels like there's more acceptance this time rather than yeah. wrestling with it is that fair to say yeah yeah and 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 also just uh you know not allowing myself to uh fully fall back into the vortex that was my life 10 years ago like right. the cocaine and right. and all that like being at this this constant battle back and forth of like and, and trying to remain on my own too and, and stay level, you know, through the whole shit. 
Did you feel that anxiety or that adrenaline kick in when you start to make this project? Like, wow, I've gone right back to the end of two. Who were you when you finished two? Like, I was a madman. You know, I, I was, my daughter was was born that year. I was scared about being a parent. I was scared about the future because I had I didn't know what I was gonna do after Man on the Moon two. I had no ideas. I think I took 2011 off. I didn't drop any music that year. Still young, still trying to figure it out. But I I, I quit cocaine cold turkey. I never really faced my issues with that. That's why I ended up coming back later on in life. Because it's not like I, I really um, addressed that shit when it happened. You know, I kind of got arrested and then uh, people knew about it and people started looking at me funny. And then it was just like, uh, you know, I don't really like the way this feels. I just knew like, look, I have this beautiful baby girl who needs me. You know, I have to, I have to rise to the occasion. You know, this is not about Kid Cudi being a role model to the fans anymore and me being scared to be that. This is a whole nother beast here. You know, I'm a, I'm a father now. Yeah. From that moment on, I was dropping a, an album every year, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Yeah. It was almost obsessive. Yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, I can't be the man on the moon anymore because that's dangerous for my health. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to stay super productive the entire time. Yeah. I didn't feel like the first two really did what I wanted it to do. And, you know, it, it, and it's like, you think about it, like, you know, we talk about those albums now, like kids, you know, they praise Man on the Moon 1 and 2, and it's like, you know, they're, they're platinum now, and it gets all this love. But 2012, 2011, people weren't, like, praising those albums like that, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and they weren't anywhere near close to being gold at that time. I mean, those albums got platinum like a, 10 years later. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was a really different time, you know? Being around long enough to understand your role and your place in all this and how time is, is funny. When you, when you believe in your own convictions, as Pharrell rightly said, that that's a core part of who you are, that it puts you on a longer journey that all makes sense at the very end, you know, when yeah. you're at the top of your own mountain and you look back on it's great. But it, was it that kind of desire for instant gratification, for that immediate respect or success that kept tripping you up? Because you talked well, yeah. about, yeah, you well, talked yeah, about being an, an underdog. Wanting the awards, wanting the sales, uh, those things weren't like the main things on my mind, but I wanted to achieve those and things. And nagging you, yeah. You know, they were all, it was always there. It wasn't like in my mind when I was working on the music or anything like that. But like when I would be done and I would listen to it, I'd be like, oh, this is Grammy worthy. I hope I get nominated. This is good. This is like dope. Like, oh man, I wonder, I hope this debut's number one. Okay. I never had a number one record. I've come close, but this is, Let's see what happens, you know? And it's like, you come close, you come close all these times and, you know, you just don't get it. And it's just, all these years has been me, like, trying my best to, you know, just do something that felt right. And when I did Speed and Bullet to Heaven, which was totally, like, a whole nother thing in itself, that wasn't about the charts or anything. That was really just me being like completely depressed and and miserable and just wanting to scream on record and just be angry for a little bit. I don't think I had that freedom and I, and I felt alive doing that, you know? You know, around Passion Pain 2016, pivotal year, an important moment that gets us to today because it, it felt like well, I don't know, you tell me, but when I, when I read what you wrote, it seemed from the outside looking in like you were like, I am sick of running from this. Yeah. Like the only way through is for me just to like, let it all go. Yeah. I had to kind of give in to the pain a little bit because I had been fighting it for so long and I had to, I had to give in to the pain because that was the only way I was going to heal. You know, I had I dropped passion pain, but I didn't, I wrote that album from like a, 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 a hopeful place. Like this, these are the things that I, I wanna, I wanna feel one day, you know. But I was still completely miserable when I made that record. Mm -hmm. So that's why Kissy Ghost was so big because it was like for the first time in 
almost forever in the history of my career, I was like really excited about doing some some new shit that was positive and like wasn't a downer and it was like uplifting and like the one thing that Kanye said he wanted to do was make a spiritual album and I was like, yes, like yeah. yes, that's Reborn. exactly what I want to do, you know? Reborn. Yeah, yeah. And that's and this he said this before we had Reborn, before when we started the project, it was just established. He was like, I want to make a spiritual album. That was like music to my ears, you know? When that record came out, as I said, it's a gift. Yeah. On every level. Yeah. And that word reborn is such an essential part of that project. Yeah. At the time. It felt like it meant two different things, because Kanye was clearly being reborn. Yeah. <laughs> at, my, in the, at the time. Yeah. It felt to us maybe like yours was more of a personal rebirth rather than a spiritual rebirth. But then I listened to songs like "Void" and "Loving Me" on the record, and it feels like faith does play a significant role in your life. Yeah, for sure. I know you heard on the album like I mentioned angels and demons and heaven and hell a lot. And I always felt like I've had my own personal relationship with God this entire time. My moments of weakness, I've always talked to him and I've always seen the light through whatever darkness I was in. It was, it was nothing that I couldn't get out of. And I know I got angels that are looking out for me every day, yeah. keeping yeah. me out of trouble keeping me safe. I truly believe that, you know, my heart is in the light and focus on good, you know, and that's who I am. As long as I keep focused on the mission, writing music that helps kids, pushing myself to make new experiences and try new things and be a better artist and, and a better man in the life, you know, whether it's too my girlfriend or to my baby mom or to my mother or to my sister, just trying to be better, you know? Was Kids See Ghosts a rebirth for you and Ye as well to some degree? Because yeah. you've been through this situation early on in your career, instrumentally influential and supportive of what you'd achieved, but naturally get things go like that, right? Yeah. Was that project about going like that? Yeah, I think, I think the fact that we were both kind of dealing with the same things at the same time is what made it such a a solid thing, you know? Because if if one of us was on another page than the other, then it would have not come together how it came together. I think we were both like feeling like we were entering new chapters in our lives. Like we just kind of shed old skin and, and we're starting new. That energy just like ran through the whole project. Is there a moment on that project that you feel is speaks to your growth through that experience more than any other? Definitely Reborn, definitely. And when I made that record, I was like, man, I hope, I hope Kanye likes this. I know this is, uh, this is a little different, but uh, at the time I just thought that maybe it was just too soft of a record fam, you know? Wow. But uh, he loved it. That's the thing, like, you know, like, we were just discovering a new thing. Like the things, all the ideas that I thought of Kanye West of what I thought he might like were out the window. Yeah. Like I thought he would hear Reborn and be like, oh, that's cool. What else you got? But like literally he was like, oh, yo, play that back. Play that back. Oh, this is our shit. This is about to be on the album. Just like that. Isn't it funny that you can be friends with someone and work so closely with them for a long time? and still seek their approval to the degree where you're not sure where you stand on equal footing with somebody. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, when I'm, when I'm working with Ye, it's always like, I hope he likes this shit. <laughs> you know? It doesn't matter how excited I get or the people in the room around me get. Like, if he doesn't fucking like it, then I gotta fucking rewrite it. But in the whole entire history of me and Kanye West working, I've never written something where he's been like, rewrite that. Never. Like, we've bounced ideas and shit. Even when, when we were doing the writing on, on uh, Kissy Ghosts, like, I would write the verse, and he would take it, read it, say, all right, cool, and record it. And I would just be like, holy f Holy shit, that was close. Like, <laughs> I just had to write a rap for yay, like, 
holy shit, like, you know, uh, I'm glad he liked it. Like, he could have said this sucks, so I can write it again. But you've been in that cauldron. You would, you've said, like, straight out the gate, here's Man on the Moon 1, go to Hawaii, sit at the table, have lunch, work on music. With who? With Ye. <laughs> and <laughs> you're working on Jay-Z stuff? Yeah. You're working on high-level stuff. And, I mean, that's the stuff that dreams are made of, but it must be its anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> Man, it was like the first night I was out there in Hawaii to work on Blueprint 3, I'm like on this, this the studio's like on, on the water, and like I'm on the balcony, and I have my laptop, and it's just me on the balcony. No one else is there. Yeah. And I'm just like smoking Newports at the time as well. Smoke Newports. So I'm like, Jane smoking cigarettes, was like on the patio, like, oh my God, I gotta have an idea. I gotta Do you still have smoke, idea. by the way? No, 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 no. I'm working on these beats that he gave me. He gave me about eight beats. He has this one beat that I love. I, 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 it's the first beat in the pack that he sent me. And I'm just like, oh my God, this beat is amazing. This is like, the the Kanye West beat, like, holy f like, I got to do something to this. Like, I got to fucking make something amazing. Like, holy sh uh Jay-Z's waiting on this. <laughs> <laughs> so then, like, I'm, I'm sitting there. I come up with an idea. I'm out there for maybe all of 10, 15 minutes. Kanye comes out. He's like, so what you got? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I've got, like, Eight beats he gave me, I only have one idea. And I was just like, hey, yeah, man, I, I got this um, this one idea. I don't know if, if you like it or not, but I'll, this is it. And he was like, tell me, tell me. So it was like, oh, they want me to fall, fall from the top. They want me to stop. They want me to drop. Oh, 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 yo, yo, record that right now, record that right now. I was like, but you sure you? He's like, yes, 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 record it. Let's go to the studio right now. We went in the booth, I recorded it. I'm nervous as shit, but like in the live room, all I see is just like people jumping around, dancing, going crazy. Like the response was wild. And I was just like in the booth like, oh, okay, all right, I have to do this a million more times. <laughs> you know, like I, it wasn't a moment where I was like, yes, I did it. It was like- You felt the pressure. Yeah, I was like, okay, now I got to do this like a million more times. Every time they come to me, I got to come with that shit. There's a quote here <laughs> that I wanted to read to you. Yeah. It's actually at the top of the comments on your TED talk when you went home. Oh, yeah. And spoke for 18 minutes and 37 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> it was Whatever intense, it was. man. That fucking clock next to me just clicking away. <laughs> no, it was funny. <laughs> it's from Donovan Barham, right? And it says, this man will never know how much he saved my life. And 2.9 thousand people have liked that comment. Oh, so when someone like Kanye sees something in you that's real, millions of other people see something in you that's real. Yeah. But you're at that low point in your life. What is that feeling like? I was more confused at that at that time, you know, about everything. I didn't see the things that other people saw in me, but I knew that as long as I just kept like working my hardest and putting my fucking 100% into everything, that I would continue creating shit that people will respond to. And that's kind of like the extent of everything. I had these ambitions of like making like cinematic sounding music and shit like that and, and taking people to new places, all these weird things. But these weren't like things that like someone who's trying to sell like a million records or whatever would do, you know, yeah. at the time, yeah. you know, put an orchestra and all these things, you know, yeah. these are like new things. Um, and these are things that I got like from Kanye or some shit that I might've got from Andre 3000 or Pharrell, you know, these were my OGs, you know, these are the guys that I kind of like saw and was like, ooh, like I want to do my own shit and make something different like that. Like I want to stick out like a sore thumb. I want to just be like Kid Cudi, like, my own genre of music, you know? And you created it, these worlds that, yeah. that ultimately lead to this new album. This is a world. I mean, it is a conceptual experience. It's yeah. four parts. Yeah. It starts in a conceptual, well, it starts familiar, and you immediately know it's a Man on the Moon project. 
It's yeah. beautiful and melodic nod to the to the history of it. And then it be- immediately moves into this conceptual space, like changing your channels, things, ideas, moving around. Do you see in your head when you're creating like that? Rather yeah. than just hear, do you see it? Yeah. Like I'm 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 doing broad strokes in my mind as I'm creating, as the beat is being constructed, I'm piecing the story all in my mind. Like for this, I might have made like 12 songs in two weeks. Wow. And and there it was like, okay, let me take a step back and see what I got now. Ooh, this song goes right here, this song goes right here, this is ooh, right Stream here. of consciousness all the way through. Yeah. Cause I'm when I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm before I start the album, I'm like, what are the things I wanna I wanna discuss? What are the things I wanna touch on? And then after I do that, then it's like I create once whatever I'm feeling with the music, right? Bang out, however long it takes me. In this case, two weeks. In a lot of other cases, months. But this was like really fast. And once I sit and I see all the stuff that I have in front of me, and I and I and I feel like I've discussed everything that I need to discuss, vomited it out, right? Then I'm like, okay, I've got the album. So when you're listening back to it, thinking about what order it takes, what shape it takes, are you learning something about yourself in that process? In the same way that I see at the beginning of our conversation, I feel like we know you. Do you yeah. get to know yourself better when you listen back to your own music? I think I do. Every time I write some shit, every time I make I make a record, I'm always like learning something new about myself. Mm-hmm. Like even with my first album, like I didn't realize that my father's death really like had an impact on me in the way that it did until I started writing about it. Then I was like, oh shit, like this is a problem for me. I didn't know that my dad dying was that big of an issue. You know, I guess it is. Oh, I guess being alone is an issue for me. I didn't know it was that big of an issue. I guess it is. You know, I guess being depressed is an issue of why I didn't know what it was. You know, I'm just making music. I'm just doing what, what feels right, but this shit is coming out. And it's like things that I probably didn't pinpoint. At that time, I, before therapy, I didn't have a therapist or any of this stuff. Like now, like, you know, the stuff that I talk about in the album are things that I might have mentioned in therapy and I've discussed with a therapist. But at know? the time, you know, you put out a song like Soundtrack of My Life. Yeah. To me, when I heard that for the first time, I felt like you were one of the only ones of your, of your peer group. Yeah. Of your generation of artists, in particular, in that room. Yeah. Who had the courage to say that. Did you feel like you were out on a limb? Like you were standing on a cliff? Yeah. On top of Mulholland? Well, yeah. For the first two nights before the album came out, I couldn't sleep. Mm-hmm. I was nervous. Mm-hmm. I was like, uh, this shit is so weird. Like, nobody's going to feel like this shit. Like, we were going to be like, they're going to hear Pursuit of Happiness and be like, what is that? Understandably so. No one was putting, you had no one to compare yourself <laughs> yeah, to. nothing, nothing, nothing. No safety net, you know? So, like, at best, I was like, oh, I got an orchestra, and people like when Kanye does it, so maybe they'll they'll be into it. With you spend 100 grand in an orchestra just <laughs> yeah. to protect your emotions? That's yeah. an expensive. I was like, maybe maybe they'll, they'll connect ex- with that. That's an expensive safety net, bro. <laughs> yeah. But literally, like, that was the first thing. When I got my deal, the first thing I asked for, I was like, yo, I want an orchestra. I was like, I need strings on this album. I knew that before I even had the deal. I knew right, that. It's almost like you knew you were going to go somewhere very heavy emotionally oh. and you needed it. Because the mixtape was one thing. I wanted to go, okay, this is the TV show. Let's, this is the fucking movie. Let's take them there. Yeah. Let's take it to a whole other place. Let's turn it up. Let's get the lights, camera, action on these motherfuckers. It's funny, I feel like when you make music, you're directing your albums. Yeah. And sometimes when I see you acting, you're doing it in a musical rhythmic way. Yeah, it's yeah, It's like yeah, you yeah. flip the two on their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They both give me the shit, you know, that, that I need, that, yeah, the feeling, you know what I mean? Like, it's like uh, the music, you know, it, it ignites something in me every time I'm doing it, you know? It, it never feels like a chore, it never feels like work. And I feel really lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And the same thing for acting. You know, I, I literally uh, have an outer body experience and I'm in the moment and I'm, and I'm there with the other actors and we're in the camaraderie. And it's just like, even I was just spending, I spent five months in Italy last year doing We Are Who We Are. I wasn't working on music during that time. Like I totally just like focused on the show. And that was a character that was so far from me and so different than anything I've ever done before that it needed my attention like that, 
You know, I needed to be like hyper focused on what I was doing. Who inspires you in that space? We know who you relate to musically. Who inspires you on screen? I know this is gonna sound cheesy, but like when I was young, when I saw Stand By Me for the first time, and I saw River Phoenix and Will Wheaton in this scene, and actually the scene is on my album. I cried when I watched this moment. Literally that moment watching this movie, that's at the end of the movie, so I'm already like, whoa, this movie was amazing. These kids look like they just spent an entire summer just hanging out shooting this movie. Like they had the time of their lives, you know? And I was like, yo, I want to do that one day. So like, I can't like think about like, yeah, I could say like Denzel Washington or something, somebody like that, right? But it was really like when I was seven years old watching a movie like Stand By Me, watching other child actors, thinking like, oh, this is pretending on a grand level. You know, I wanted to do shit that's powerful. Like this, this shit that I just did, we are who we are. It's the most powerful shit I've ever done. And I'm so proud of it, you know, because I have something like that in the, in the universe now. You know, I want to do more of it, more stuff like that. I want the show to come back for a second season. I want to work with Luca again. You know, I want to do some stuff with Shia and we got some projects we're working on and like, I just want to do more, more of that, you know? Because I need, I need to, just like the music, I need to feel something. You know, that's the only way this shit is going to be stimulating for me. Hey, there's a lyric that, that comes up pretty quick on the movie, which really grabbed me, which was um, standing on a cliff on Mulholland Drive, which I've ref referenced before in a different context. Mm -hmm. it's, a really, it's a really incredible image, because if you've ever been to Los Angeles and been to Mulholland Drive, which goes on forever, there's a lot of places you can go that no one will ever find you at yeah. that moment in time. Is that yeah. what it is to be on your own? To actually embrace the isolation that you probably feared as a kid and just be like, I'm into it. Like, let me just go and be in my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I lived off of Laurel Canyon, that was my route. Like I used to always like, late at night, just take a drive up Laurel Canyon and go and post up and just smoke my weed and just be on the lookout. And just think. You know, and just think. With this, it was like, I wanted to like, take people back to that scene again, back to Mahalan Drive, back to this, this moment, back to the trailer that people saw like in the end. So like now like when people hear the album, they'll go back to the trailer and they'll be like, ah, oh, so that was the scene. And then this is like, oh, 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 oh. Like they'll piece it together, you know? But the revelations continue. And it's funny because in act one, it starts super hard. And it's like, we're drawn into this world where the beats are tough, and you're really rapping. It's like stretching yourself lyrically and, and on the mic, but you're also still dropping these things. Yeah. Like that moment, like where you say, like, tell my mom I'm sorry. It's kind of like, you know, admitting that my mom would be really disappointed if she thought that like, um, I allow myself to go back to that place again, you know? I never want to let my mom down. And, um, but it's kind of like, that's, that's where I'm at. And, and, and that's why I put that line in there. Cause it's like, it's kind of like, this is, this is what it is. This is my reality and this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through and, and, um, yeah, tell my mom I'm sorry. Do you still feel like, despite all the growth, that it's there, you know? Even with the tools and the therapy that, mm -hmm. that it's still there in you. Do you think it'll always be there, right? Because I, I suffer, I'll, I'll put myself in the picture, I suffer from anxiety for real, like I really mm -hmm. do. And I just had to accept at some point, it's always gonna be there. Yeah, I think that's something that I've come to terms with in the last two years. In a lot of ways, these feelings don't necessarily go away. They hide and go in hiding for a while, and then they wait for the right moment and they pop back up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you're like, oh, shit, I haven't felt this in eight months. Yeah. My mind is going this place. I've, I've, I haven't gone there in four years. But it's how we pump the brakes, right? Yeah. I also feel like talking about it, therefore inspiring others to realize they're not alone, 
yeah. ultimately makes you feel the same way. That that sharing of information has mutually beneficial effects in that regard. It does. It does. Because it, it, where I'm feeling alone, I don't feel so alone when I see the response and I see that it's affecting so many people. You know? So it does give me... The music has always been, like, and I've always said this, it's been one big SOS, yeah. you know, out to the world to see who out there connects with what I'm saying, who feels the same way. What's a good day feel like, though? Good day's great. Good day's great. Talking to my daughter, talking to my sister, hanging out with my friends, writing music, but no album in mind, just kind of making music. Yeah. That's always a good a good time when when you're not... There's no pressure to make something. Yeah, but you've leaned into the anticipation on this record in the biggest way. Right. So you must kind of love it when you know you've got something to go. Right. Yeah, 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 I do. But I also, I do like when there's just no pressure at all. We were working on Kissy Ghosts for the whole year and, and all of 2018 up until it was released. Reborn was made in one of those sessions where we were just like, yeah, let's just get together and just like, no pressure. I know we're working on Kissy Ghost, but like. Let's just, see what happens. Yeah, let's just go around, you know? And that shit came out, how it came out. So like th there's magic that happens in those moments. Same thing with, with Passion Pain and Demon Slaying. I made Swim in the Light and Releaser before I even decided that I was making Passion Pain and Demon Slaying. I made those during the Life of Pablo sessions because yeah. Kanye was working on shit in the other studio and I'd be in the other studio and I had Mike Dean in there and I was just like, man, I got Mike Dean, Plain Pat, and everybody in this room, we about to make something. And we'd be making music in one room and they'd be in the other room. And that's how it happened. Like, I was just like, shit. Cause like, after Speed and Bullet to Heaven, I was like, man, I don't know when I'm gonna do another album, man. People shit on that album so much. It's like, man, I don't know when. Like, so like, I just kind of stumbled. We were, we were in the studio on my birthday and we were just making shit and, and I made Swimming the Light, then I made Frequency. Frequency, and I was like, "Yo, I'm doing an album." You know, it just kind of it naturally happens. So, like these moments where I'm like in the studio where there's no pressure to do anything, some beautiful shit comes out of that, those sessions. You know, I feel like I wouldn't have gotten to that place if I was like, "All right, before these records, like I'm gonna make a Man on the Moon three and let's set up studio for Man on the Moon three. Yeah. Like it totally wouldn't have happened like that. It would have been. It would have been a whole nother thing. We would have been thinking about it too much. You know what I mean? It would have been the yeah. pressure of just trying to make this album. And that's the thing. I had to like make sure that what I was doing was what I was doing. You know, if it was if I was really making a man on the moon three, if that's where I was going with it. And could it be done? Did I feel in my heart of hearts that like I could do better than the first two? Oh man. The you know. cadence on this record is unreal, like the way it starts and goes through. And like I said, beautiful trip, tequila shots. Yeah, it's hard, but it's also emotional. It's like, this is where I was. I need to get out of this place. And then you just rage, Mr. Rager. Yeah. It's just you're out. <laughs> yeah. And I think about like the beats and the way you're rapping and moving through the, you know, act two. Yeah. It's just leading all the way through this unreal record with Pop Smoke, you know, and Skepta. When did you realize that you wanted to like really rap on this because it's not a given with you early, that we're going to get that yeah yeah early on before i before i started working on this shit, and i was like my next shit gotta be like bars yeah. like i knew that because like i just remember like travis saying something to me about my raps he was just like man your your raps man i love when you rap and i was just like okay i kept that in mind i was like okay like travis is saying my raps are good that must be something that the kids like I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> is this why you were like working on on the Scots? No, no, this before. is yeah, this is yeah, right when we were working on the Scots, like right. early on, before we had the Scots song, right. you know. But this is like early on sessions, right? I just like wanted to give him exactly what he loved about Kid Cudi, and 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 for him, it was these bars, you know. But I felt like in hip hop, I'm slept on as a rapper, you know, as a as a as a lyricist and. I really wanted to elevate my whole shit on that front, on this project. And I did that with, with the rapping and the singing. Uh, everything has kind of evolved. And, and the added little sprinkle of ad-libs. Mm -hmm. 
something I've never really done before either. You know, I've done, I was able to do it in my own little way, you know? So it, it remains authentic and just doesn't sound like I'm doing ad libs like everybody else, you know? What's the energy like in the studio when, you know, when you're going into rap versus any of the other many shades of what Kid Cudi as an artist creates? Day Trip and Dr. Genius pretty much produce this whole album, right? So a lot of the times I would be in the studio with them, they would be working on a beat, and I would just be not writing in my memos yet, but kind of just like thinking of flows and ideas for hooks in my mind as they're creating. So by the time they're finished, I have a dozen ideas, right? They finish, it's a system. It's like they bang out the beat for about an hour, lay it down, I lay a reference immediately. Then I write that bitch from there, immediately. We finish the song in the night. Speed is important to you. Yeah, because like, I did a session with Snoop Dogg years ago. He wrote this verse for the song we did. It was a song that never came out officially. It was like, it was a song that leaked or whatever, um, and we never put it out officially. I remember Snoop coming in the studio, me playing the beat for him, him getting a pen and some paper, writing this verse in like 15 minutes <laughs> and laying it down. And it was like, chef's kiss. <laughs> 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 like I always like, I, ever since that moment, I was like, yo, I want to get to that level. Cause it didn't take me 15 minutes to write a rap at that time. You know, it right. took me hours, you know? Yeah. Um, so like over the years, I've just gotten better with this writing shit. I'm not uh, judging myself when I'm writing something. I'm, I'm letting it flow. I'm not like, oh no, not this, not that. I'm just like, dope, dope line. Maybe I can say this different, dope. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> I just love the idea that you're like, 2020 is gonna be the year I'm gonna come out there, I'm gonna take my seat at the table and I'm not gonna be underrepresented or underestimated in the rap game anymore. Where's Eminem? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? I yeah, mean, the, rap, had... the rap god. I mean, like, yeah, it's like yeah. to, to put a record out with, with Eminem, I yeah, knew of yeah. your own project was just the bossiest move. Well, that was, that was me, like, be like, yo, I want to be respected as an MC, yo. Who do I fucking get? Who do I fucking spar with? Who do I go bar for bar with? Eminem. But how the f do you get Eminem to actually? I know. I Man, mean, he, I, I, I tweeted at him. <laughs> it went down in the DMs? Yeah. No, it wasn't even in the DMs. It was just in my, my timeline. Oh, my God. Like, it was public like, timeline. Yeah, yeah. It was public. Like, I was like, yo, rap god, help. And we're, and we're, we're really close with Paul Rosenberg, and, and he was able to connect us, and, and we were able to, to, to get it done. And, and were you remote or were you together? No, we, he was in Detroit. I was in L.A. So what's that experience like when you're trading versus back and forth? It's a nail biter because I'm, like, waiting. I'm waiting, I'm like, oh shit, you know? They're asking me questions, they like, they don't say he's he's gonna do it just yet, they're just asking me questions. And I'm yeah. like, so this means he's gonna do it, right? Because they're yeah. asking me questions. <laughs> and, and literally it was like, every day I was like, is it today gonna be the day? Is today gonna be the day? And like, I got it and I was like, holy shit. I was like, it was something for me to get the validation from Eminem by doing that record. Him doing that record let me know like, he was telling me like, yo, I fuck with you as an artist, fully. Even your bars are dope. Was it part of the, the kind of inspiration and the validation you needed to, to really lean into Man on the Moon 3 in that way? Yeah, because I had that song before I, before I uh, got into Man on the Moon 3. Well, there's some amazing guests and amazing collaborations, not too many, which is actually lovely. Yeah. Because I think we all want a lot of you on this kind of, in this experience, especially yeah. a Man on the Moon project, right? It makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, one song that really jumps out for me is the Trippy song. His performance on that is really moving because I know that the loss of his peers really affects him. We've spoken about it. Yeah. And that's really at the core, despite the, the wordplay, what's going on there, right? Yeah. The rock star life could have gone the other way. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, Trippy came in, I, I played him a few records and he, he kind of like got the tone, knew, the importance of it being a man on the moon and went in there and hit it out the park. Like, it was like, perfect, you know? Like, a, a perfect subject matter. And he just rode the beat in, a, in, a, in an epic way. You know, and then it moves, you know, we talk about a song like Show Out, 
with Skepta and with Pop Smoke. I can't recall, is that the first posthumous appearance by an artist on one of your albums? Yes. How did that feel, knowing that Pop Smoke made such an impact in such a short amount of time, 100% built a legacy, a sound, something that we all appreciate and, and people really miss? How did that feel, knowing that you had that appearance on the record and it was coming? Well, it was, it was, it was powerful because, like, uh, I talked to Steven Victor about this, and he said when he when he first recorded this this song, um, he had thought of me on it. Steven had thought of me on it. Wow. The reason why I kind of I got this record, Dr. Genius and Plain Pat had worked with Pop before he blew up mm -hmm. at the brewery in New York at Dot Studio, when they had this record. They just never did anything with it. It was just something that Dot had on top. You know, and I was chilling with him one day because Dot's working on an album and he was like, yo, I got this record. I'm going to play it for you. Let me know what you think. He plays his shit. And I'm like, I need this. Like, I need this, man. I was like, nobody's ever heard me on anything like this. Skepta sounds amazing. Pop Smoke sounds amazing. Like, this would be so unexpected. I think I could be on this and I could hold it down and like do my thing. Yeah. And this is also another way I can, you know, showcase these bars. Yeah. Yeah, you the know? beat is obscene. Yeah, Dr. Genius, playing Pat. It's a moving moment. It always is when you hear Pop Smoke. It always is because of the intensity of his performance and the, and the, the authenticity that he, he had so immediately. Yeah. Um, it's a huge, huge moment that. And it must be for you, for someone who has been through a lot yourself and being so open with your struggles. When you see people pass, and I know that the circumstances around pop are different and they, they're different for everybody, but just bringing it back into the framework of the artistic spirit and how it doesn't always last, it doesn't always end well. It can lead artists to make decisions that are just tragic and sad. Yeah. And there's something about the artistic spirit which seems so larger than life and gives so much, but it's, there's a vulnerability to that which I, it keeps coming up in conversation with artists that I'm speaking to, especially now. It's like the conversation space is open for this conversation to be had. Like, yeah. we're not invincible. Yeah, There's something to this that, we, that needs to be identified and understood and protected because the, the desire for artists to work all the time can have a negative impact. Yeah, and I think I, think I had to kind of take a step back in my own career. Yeah. Because like I was saying, I was dropping an album every year from 2012 to 2016. Because I need to. Yeah, because of some, some psycho whatever was going on in my mind yeah. for those five years. Yeah. You know, I needed it. Now, I do an album every other year. I'm not like on the heels of another album working on more shit, working on more shit. Like I have time to go do a movie or two. Hmm. Or write a TV show. Or go do my animated show. Or just go hang out with my daughter. Have her come to LA. Kick it for two weeks and not have anything to do, you know? Yeah. My life is so paced now. Doing this album every other year is like, that changed everything for me. Like, everything. The whole flow of my life is like, it's so in tune with like everything that I want it to be. Like, I'm solid with my baby mom. I'm solid with my mom. I'm solid with my sister. I'm solid with my daughter. I'm solid with my niece, nieces. Because uh, I got my niece, Amanda, who's, uh, who's going to be working with me on my production company that I just started with Amazing. Bron Studios. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, like everything's, everything's in place, man. And, and I'm happy, you know? So touring, as and when? Oh, yeah. It's a live album. This album was made with touring in mind. I really plan on hitting the ground running when, when we can get back out there, man. Cause uh, it's been a long time since I've been on a, a big tour and I, run a, I wanna blow this up. And where would a song like Lord I Know fit into that as an album closer? We know how it starts. What does that song mean to the album and to the overall experience for fans when they hear this album, when we hear this album and going forward? What is that song? How does it fit? Oh man, that's kind of like the, that spiritual hymn, that cutty classic spiritual hymn or like, Lord, I know you can make it right. You'll always have someone looking out for you, you know, and you're not alone in this. 
And I think that that's one of the messages that I want people to pick up on the album is, is the fact that there is someone looking out for you on this journey. And this might seem like you're out there on your own and it's crazy and there's a lot of shit happening. But, um, you know, I do believe in, in something that's, that, that's looking out for us and keeping us safe, you know? <laughs> 